right. Happy Sabbath. How's everyone doing? Good? All right, all right. It is a pleasure to be uh, with the rest of the church here uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona. All right, all right. Uh, in case you don't know me, I'm Pastor Randy Ramos. I've been blessed, that is the word, blessed with the high school students all week long. Uh, we've been going over this theme or this series called Real Relationship. And so we were able to tackle very different um, ways of looking how God relates to us, how we relate to God, and how we relate to people. And I'm hoping that this morning we get to explore the last part, how we should relate to people, right? Let's pray. God, thank you for church. Thank you for community. And God, I pray that through this message, not only do we just hear the words or maybe think that it's nice, but we actually live it. We actually practice this stuff. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to not just be our savior and our teacher, but to be the best example. And Father God, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So today's topic, I call it the art of hospitality, right? I finally think I have the clicker now. All right. Let's see if this works. All right. The heart or the art, the heart, I guess that could work too. All right. So the art of hospitality. What does that mean? So according to the NLT, I love reading from the NLT. According to the NLT concordance, AKA like a dictionary, right? It's a generous and con or cordial treatment. This is my favorite word, by the way, reception or disposition. So we're gonna be unpacking what hospitality looks like through scripture, okay? All right, so all my Spanish folks out there, we're gonna repeat this phrase right here. You guys ready? Mi casa, Mi casa. Es, tu casa. es tu casa. One more time. Mi casa, Mi casa. Es, tu casa. es tu casa. All right. So this is a very, very heavy thing that we say in our culture. Every time a guest is invited over to the house or an apartment where I live, your or my house, my place, my domain becomes yours. It's an endearing, welcoming type of, uh, like, just invitation, right? And so I, I, I use this a lot to anybody who's trying to just, who, the, for the person that I invite to my house uh, for the very first time. Now, I have a really good friend who's also a pastor, and his name is Pastor Jonathan. We go way back. That dude is my homie, right? We've been good friends for a really, really long time. And so last year, I had invited him over to my house. And so the moment that he came in, you know, he's gonna, we're, we're gonna have some bro time, all right? So we were gonna have like a sleepover, and then the following day, we were actually going to preach together. So this is gonna be like a dynamic duel type of thing. So then I invited him over, so he comes over, and he has his like suitcase and whatnot. I was like, do you really need a suitcase for like a one night thing, right? So he brings his suitcase, he sits down, and we just start talking about the Bible. We start, like, really doing into, like, you know, just theology type of stuff. Long story short, the next day comes, we preach the sermon together, and in my head, I think, well, you know, after lunch, he's probably going to leave, right? So we eat lunch. <laughs> it's funny. We eat lunch. He sits down on my couch. And he starts taking off his socks, which I thought it was kind of weird, like if I'm being honest. So he takes off his socks, and he's like, hey, bro, I'm going to take a nap right here. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. So he takes a nap, and homeboy just kind of leans back, and he starts snoring. I mean, this is his house type of thing. And so what I'm alluding to this is that he literally took this as a literal expression. You feel me? Like, the moment he got in into my house, it was his house because I had invited him that way. And I said, everything that I have in my house is yours. And it's true. This dude took full advantage. I mean, he got up, and he just went to the kitchen. He grabbed whatever he wants. 
And I'm like, oh, okay, that's just who he is, right? So he goes and he goes to the, to the snack shelf. He grabs some snacks. And I was like, oh, man, you're just opening up my bags of chips. All right, whatever. It's your house, right? It's your house. But this is what it means of hospitality, to be able to open up the house to somebody else and say, see, the place that you are here, it also belongs to you, right? Okay, so let's go on to this. Matthew chapter 9. Now, if you want to follow along from your pew, I invite you with your Bible. I love it. You know, I love now doing PowerPoints. I wasn't a PowerPoint guy, but now I am. All right. So Matthew chapter 9, let's just put things into context. What's happening in Matthew chapter 9 is that these group of friends bring this paralyzed man to Jesus. They bring him through. And so when we get to verse 9, or or not verse 9, chapter 9, we're seeing that Jesus is amazed by the faith of of, of the paralyzed man's friends. Like his friends bring him in. And Jesus is like, Wow, just so captivated by the faith that they have by bringing in this paralyzed, sick man to this man named Jesus. So we get to verse 3, and here we go again, because we've been talking about Pharisees and what they say and what they've been saying, and this is a very typical Pharisee thing to say. So look at verse 3, it says, But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, See, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? So last night we talked about the misidentification of Jesus. So many many people try to put Jesus in his place. They They try to categorize him as just a prophet, not a savior, not the Messiah. Or people were questioning about him. And so again, the Pharisees are doing the exact same thing. Does he think he's God? Do you think he's God? You better believe so. Okay? All right, here we go. Hopefully, oh no. Okay, I think we should get it. All right, so I got backup. It's all right, it's all right. So we're looking at verse four. Okay, thank you. So verse four says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? And I can just picture this because Jesus is literally looking at these Pharisees and these Pharisees are just looking at these at this sinner, these sinner people over here, right? And so Jesus reads the heart of the person or the people. And he says, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you, and this is Jesus, by the way, right? That the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Now, this is what I want you guys to know. The Pharisees try to challenge the authority of Jesus every single time. And so Jesus, proving to the, Phar- or, yeah, to the Pharisees, Jesus is saying, yo, Pharisees, I have the authority over here. The son of man. This is what he came for. And so what I want you guys to realize is that these Pharisees were practicing the opposite of hospitality. In fact, they were being inhospitable. Inhospitable says, through this text, as we're seeing this, the uh, the inhospitality, I think that's how you say it. I'm sorry. English is kind of like my second language. But when we look at these people being inhospitable, we're seeing that they close the door on Jesus. You're not welcome to this place. Does he think he's the son of God? They close the door on this paralyzed man because clearly they don't care about him. All they do is care about the law. And so we look at this. We're seeing that these Pharisees are just practicing the opposite of what the kingdom of God entails. Okay, so let's look at this, all right? Now that we've built some content, all right, so we're going to skip. We're just going to read this real quick. Verse 7 says, and the man jumped and went home because for however many years this man is paralyzed, Jesus had saved him. 
Amen to that, right? And so we look at verse 8. It says that fear swept the crowd as they saw this happen. And they praise God for giving, for giving humans such authority, right? Okay, now we're going to get into the meat of things. Check this out. Just like sinners or people that are sick need a hospital, sinners need a hospital. Sinners need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Okay, I hope you believe that. Let's go with this. Jesus flips the script. What do I mean by this? See, the narrative is that the Pharisees living in this time, you just don't associate with sinners. Mm -mm. Nuh -uh -uh. You better not go to that table. Right? Back in middle school, when I was a kid and just walking around the, the hallways of middle school, I went to a public school, right? Woo -hoo. Okay, so being at a public school is such a different environment. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So being at a different environment, I learned that the people that I was hanging around with, the so-called nerds, like I was associating myself with them, one time, one of my supposed friends, I saw him as an acquaintance, but my classmate, let's just put it that way. My classmate came up to me and says, dude, why do you hang out with the nerds? Those are my friends. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with that? We like talking about comic books. It's all good. So what? Right? And so in that moment, I started to see things from a different way. I started to feel insecure. Because somebody brought this idea that I was hanging out with these type of people. These type of people. And so during Jesus' time, the narrative was, if you are a leper, if you have leprosy, if you have sinned and committed adultery, if you're a prostitute, you just don't hang out with those people because they are sinners. And so Jesus comes, and that's the narrative, but he flips the script, and he says, uh-uh, I'm going to hang out with them. I'm going to associate with them. Check this out. We're going to get into the meat of it. Look at this. Verse 9. Ooh, I love this, by the way. Verse 9 says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Okay, let's just pause that for a second. Look at the imagery behind this. Matthew's is punching in his numbers, right? And all of a sudden, a man stands right in front of him at his tax collector's booth. Let me actually explain, in case you don't know, that tax collectors back in the day had a very bad reputation. The reputation was... See, if you work for the government, especially the Roman Empire government, if you work for them, you're already, especially being a Jew, you're already an enemy to the rest of the Jews because you work for them. And since they were trying to liberate themselves from the oppressive government of, uh, of the Roman Empire, by being their friend, you're also an enemy to the rest of your own people. And so in these moments... Matthew is just pulling up a file for the next person who's coming in, right? It's like an H&R block sort of thing, right? He's collecting tax. He's a tax collector. And back in the day, too, tax collectors not only had a bad reputation for being with the Roman government, but also because they took some money for themselves. Ooh, they were crooks. Whether it happened or not, by association, you already had this reputation, Right? So the association of this is that Jesus comes up to this cheater, this tax collector, this dude who has a bad reputation, and Jesus comes up to him and says, yo, follow me and be my disciple. And so I can imagine that Matthew just took off his apron and says, bruh, I ain't coming back here. I'm walking away. So he walks away, and Jesus said to him, so Matthew got up and followed him. Now this is beautiful because earlier this week, we were able to examine the rich young ruler. 
And Jesus said the exact same thing to the rich young ruler. Right? Sell your possessions to the poor, and then what? Come follow me. So the difference between this rich young ruler and Matthew, the huge difference is that Matthew took off his apron and he followed Jesus. Right? He followed Jesus. And so the, the narrative continues to go, and it gets a lot better. And before we look at verse 10, this is what I want you guys to know. What we don't realize about hospitality is that it also means the opening of the heart to another person. Okay? So we talked about mi casa es tu casa, right? But when it comes to the deepness of hospitality, is that hospitality says not only is mi casa tu casa, but I'm, in, I'm welcoming you, I'm inviting you into my heart. You belong here. You're in my heart. And we're going to dive into this a little bit more, but check this out. Look at what it says. Verse 9, or, ver, or chapter 9, verse 10, it says, later, later, right, Matthew invited Jesus as, and his disciples to his home as dinner guests. Now, yo soy de Salvador, all right, I'm from, my parents are from El Salvador, okay. Up in our house, sometimes, my mom doesn't really do this, but when she buys them, definitely my aunts do this, so like the rest of my family, we like to do pupusas. Amen, amen, all right, all right, anybody, anybody, yes, okay, good, amen, sisters in the back. All right, so, I can just picture this, now this is just a wild imagination, but picture this, Matthew inviting Jesus over so, for some pupusas, right? So he comes over. He comes over, and they probably had just fish or something like that, right? But he comes over, and this is the beautiful part about hospitality. See, Matthew, by following Jesus, and he has no idea what he just did or what he's about to get himself into, but Matthew, by following Jesus, the mission is already instilled in Matthew's mind because he sends out his group text to his homies, his, his ex-tax uh, 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 collectors, his colleagues, and he says, yo, come over. Jesus is over. Come over. Come over my house, right? And so this is beautiful. Look at this. It says, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners, and so all these sinners, right, they're going over to Matthew's house, and Jesus is just waiting at the table for them. This is the mission. Not only did Matthew open up the house for Jesus Christ himself, but he was willing to open up his heart to him. And that's the beautiful thing. The mission of this, and let me tell you guys, for me, growing up in the city, growing up in a church, anybody walks through the church. Whether it's a person who's been struggling with drugs or, or an alcoholic or, 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 or people that are just don't have a home, homeless people coming in through the church. The idea is, if we're going to practice hospitality, that we don't just literally close our doors on them or close our hearts. And so check this out. This is what it says. See, practicing hospitality is a way of saying, you, you belong here, and I'm glad you're here. That's what hospitality is. Now, this is what is challenging, because when people look different from us, when people uh, have a different lifestyle than us, or come from a different type of background, we're easy to say, you know what, I don't know you, so I'm not going to invite you here. This is what's important about hospitality. Because you come with an open heart for whoever you are, and you say, the person that doesn't look like me or have the same lifestyle as me, you belong here. And I'm glad that you're here. This is what it's all about, gospel. We're thinking about, you know, reaching to the world and going out there. Well, let me tell you, it all starts with the availability of an open heart. 
it's such an important message to this. As we're about to close this up, what, I've, what I have established for you is for you to see that Matthew gave Jesus a chance. Matthew left his reputation at the table and said, Jesus, I'm willing to follow you, whatever it takes. And so check this out. As we're switching gears, and I promise we're almost done with this, let's look at the book of Revelation, chapter 3. There's a beautiful illustration to the church of Laodicea. Okay, In case you don't know, this church specifically in Asia Minor, when you study the church of Laodicea, they were known for being rich, like really rich. Like, in fact, when you look at the, at the archaeological findings and the historical findings of it, there was an earthquake that happened, and I think it happened 60 AD or something like that. I apologize if I don't give you the correct date of it, but there was a huge earthquake that just literally broke through the city of Laodicea, and guess who paid it? The rich people that already lived there. In fact, the Roman government tried to say, hey, we, we could pay for this, and they're like, no, 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 we got this, we got this, right? So what's most important about this church is that Jesus writes uh, seven different letters to the churches of Asia Minor, right? So when we look at Revelation chapter 3, this is a letter written to this specific group of people. Look at verse 14. It says, write this letter, right? Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is a message from the one who is the amen. This is Jesus, right? The faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. And so look at this. Verse 15 says, I know all the things you do. And by the way, when you study all seven messages in Revelation given to these churches, it all starts like that. Jesus says, I know the things you've been doing, all of it. And so when we look at this, it says that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. Historically speaking, where this hot and cold comes from, y'all have a faucet, right? Okay. In the city, if you were living in the city, they literally had this Roman type of aqua, aqueduct system, a water system that was like state of the art. Miles and miles away, if you literally wanted water, running water, they built this stuff, by the way. Look at the history of it. Pay attention to the history class. All right. So the faucet, if you wanted to get water that was, a, that was like, a, like, like from a well or a spring that was miles away from the city, all you had to do is kind of just open this thing, and eventually, after some time, water would get to your house. It's crazy. Now, what's interesting about this hot well, it's a hot well, by the way, it's a super hot spring. So by the time the water went all the way down to the city and you opened it and you grabbed water, guess what temperature the water was? Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Good guess. It's all right. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. And then let me ask you this. If you went to a restaurant and you went up to the waiter or the waitress and you said, can I just get a glass of lukewarm water? They would look at you funny, right? Because who wants to drink? Let's make this a difference. And I'm sorry we have to get through this, right? But the difference between temperature water and lukewarm water, there's a huge difference in that. Now, in the Hispanic culture, when your tooth is about to fall, I don't know if y'all ever gone through this, when your tooth is about to fall, this is so weird. My first tooth fell, and so my dad was like, all right, just sip this, but don't, don't drink it. Just like, you know, gar yeah, just do the gargoyle thing, whatever, right? So I was like, okay. So I drank, and it was straight up lukewarm water, and I spit it out. It was like the first time. It's an unpleasant thing. But where I'm going with this is that Jesus is alluding to this church who's 
involved with their riches, but still want to praise God, but still have their heart in, in their money, but then say, God, you're cool, but then oppress the poor with their riches. So they're going back and forth. And so Jesus is saying, yo, stop it. Stop it. And he says, I wish you were one or the other. Now, this is important. Because when you're in, the, in con, like the confusion aspect of your life, when you're saying, I know, or I don't know, and you just keep going back and forth, not only does it leave you confused, but it leaves everybody around you confused. And what is this person talking about? I don't know. And so Jesus is saying, yo, I wish you were cold. Because then I would know that you're cold. I wish you were hot because then I would know that you actually love me. And so when we look at this, look at what it says in verse 16. It says, but since you are lukewarm, like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Okay, let's end with this. Let's go with this. Next, I'm, I'm sorry, I even forgot I had the clicker. Okay. We're almost done. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want, and I don't need a thing, right? And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. You just sang that song. It's cool. Then you will be rich and also buy white garments from me. So you will not be ashamed by your nakedness and anointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. And I love this right here. Look at verse 19. I correct and discipline everyone I love. That's good, Jesus. Thank you. That's great. I need that in my life. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. And Jesus doesn't end right here. He ends right here. Look at this. He says, look, I stand at the door. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. Look at the description of this. And before I end, this is what it looks like. Jesus coming up to the door of the person Going like this. Yo, it's me, Jesus. You gonna open up? Or are you gonna be inside? See, many times you have this theology, and I, and I feel like this was directed more for the person who asked when we were having the Q&A yesterday. If you are here, praise God. But there was a question yesterday that said, well, something along the lines of, if I love God and God tells me to love him, then I must have to, like, worship him. How is that love? And so we get this mistake where we think that Jesus is this barging into our lives, like he's barging through the door and saying, FBI, let me just come in, right? Jesus barging in and saying, you have to have a meal with me. But look at this description. I stand and knock at the door. Yo, Randy, let me eat with you. And sometimes we approach Jesus as we're also inhospitable. We approach Jesus from this line and say, God, sorry, you're just not welcome here. Sometimes, and, and this is real talk, no offense to the Jehovah Witnesses that come through our door, but sometimes we look at the curtain and be like, dude, they're outside. You guys ever had that? Like, dude, don't open the door. Like, pause the TV, pause the Netflix, because they'll hear us, and it's rude. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. But that's what it looks like. They're standing at the door and knocking. My favorite part about this is that we have the choice, the freedom of will to say, God, open the door, come in, 
Let's eat together. Let's talk, God. That is what real relationship looks like. This is what the epitome of every talk that I've had the entire week comes down to this, allowing God to come into your door, to come into your life, and sitting down and eating with God himself. Now, I'm taking this one more step further. Why can't we do that to people that are often looked down as or don't look like us And say, yo, come into my door, let's have a meal together. And I'm not just literally speaking about this. I'm talking about from our heart perspective. Why can't we just sit down and say, yo, I love you. In the name of Christ, the the, the love of Christ that is reflected upon my life, I love you. And this is the part that we miss. Because we could say, I love God, and I know I can love myself but I don't love my neighbor. And so things don't work like that because the book of 1 John says, yo, if you, if you hate somebody else, come on, bro, get it together. You can't say that you love God. You can't do that. And so I'm inviting you from where you're seated to look at this from a perspective of hospitality, to practice it. And the first step is to allow God into your heart, and then you reach out to other people because that is the mission of the gospel. That is the mission of hope. And so that when we bridge this together, we're able to have a family meal together in the name of Christ. I'm going to share one more experience, and this is where I'm going to end. A few years ago, My first year at PUC, Pastor Zach was still there. Amen to that. All right. So Pastor Zach was still there. And by the way, he was a senior already getting married, right? Like he was already like getting ready. And here I was, this this lowly freshman. Anyway, long story short, I keep ranting about that. I love you, bro. All right. So going on, somebody invited me to go to a prison ministry. And I was like, nope, I ain't going there because I feel like I may not come back. And so one day, a Friday night, I knew my friend was just trying to, he was trying to find the right time. I kept saying no. I kept making excuses for not to go. And he's like, yo, hey, what are you doing next week? And he just caught me off guard. And I was like, uh, 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 nothing. <laughs> All right, come with me to the prison ministries. He's like, you're in, right? And it was in front of like a lot of people. And I was like, peer pressure, peer pressure. All right, I'm in. <laughs> So the following week, that Friday night, I was like, Lord, tomorrow I may not see 24 hours. I may not be able to live tomorrow. But God, I give it all to you. <laughs> so, so the following morning, I had this Jesus t-shirt. So cool. I had this Jesus t-shirt. I had my Bible. And I'm like, God, today I'm going to war with myself because this is, this is this whole area. I just, I'm trying to get over this lump. This, this spiritual lump. So I get to the hospital, or not the hospital, I get to the prison, and oh my goodness, let me tell y'all. One gate, two gates, three gates, four gates, padded down, fifth gate, and we just kept going through, and it just made me more and more anxious. And finally, when we passed the last gate, I remember the prison guard saying, yo, there's no turning back from here. Okay, well, again, if I die, I die with my Bible. <laughs> so we go in, and they're like, yo, you guys need to walk in a straight line and don't look at anyone. And that was the first thing I did. <laughs> like, I looked at somebody and was like, what's up? And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Just kept walking. And I got to the chapel. And let me tell you guys, this is one of the greatest experiences of my life. The inmates sat down. We had Sabbath school with them. It was great. Talked about God. We talked about, by the way, I remember seeing one of the inmates' Bible, and it just looked way better than mine. Like, it was torn. And let me just, just follow me on this. It was torn. It had 
markings all over, highlighter, like, like all these different types of highlighter pen colors, and there were notes, and I was just like, wow, I wish I could study my Bible like that. I wish I could spend God, spend time with God like that. And so we started going over, and this is crazy. I'm just going to tell the whole experience because it's, it's the whole nine yards. There was this guy who was giving Sabbath school, and he just looked funky. And I was like, bro, is he about to, like, faint? And yes, he did. He fainted. My brother was just like, he is really hot in here, and he just fell back. And everybody started getting scared. And then it's just a whole crazy story. Like, the guards came in. They, like, put us to the side. And I was like, see, Jesus, I might just die here. Right? <laughs> and so the guard came up to me and said, did you touch him? Or did the, did the inmates touch him? No, 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 no. He just fainted. I don't know what happened. So then they carried him off on a stretcher. It was crazy. And so one of my colleagues, one of my friends comes up to me and says, yo, we could either go with him or we continue to do the gospel. They both looked at each other and said, if we keep going with this, the dude's going to be okay. So we kept talking and talking with the inmates. My friend preached the word. It got to them. They were like, amen, amen. It was so great. And at the end, there was this dude who's an inmate, big dude. And I mean like 6'8 type of dude. He came up to me and I was like, Lord, I knew it. This is the time, right? He came up to me, his chest all tatted up. He's like, sup? Hey, man. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. <laughs> and so in that moment, I, I looked at him and I had to like look at him. And I was like, yes. <laughs> like, I can't can help you? And he's like, I appreciate you guys taking the time, coming over here, preaching the word to us. This is what he said. I've stolen, I've murdered, I've done X, Y, and Z. The world has judged me, but my God still saves me. And so in that moment, I was inspired. I was on the verge of tears. Because here I am outside of these gates, living a life of freedom. And this dude over here saying, I still have freedom in Christ. And so when I looked at him, in the most hospitable way, I wasn't allowed to do this. But I hugged him. Because I said, you are welcome here. This is what it comes down to, guys. Hospitality. Love one another. Encourage people to run the race. You see the young people up here leading out in worship. Praise God. Encourage one another. Love one another. Be hospitable with one another. Practice it. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this message. Thank you for the message of revelation. That, Lord, you are standing at that door and knocking on our hearts. And I just pray, Father God, that we truly, truly practice hos hospitality with you first before we practice with others. God, be with us. Allow us to be in this real relationship with you, God. Father, most of us come into this place still confused, still like the church of Laodicea saying, I don't know. But thank you, God, because I know by being with you, you are calling us to have this eternity lasting relationship with you in Christ thank you father for this week and the opportunity of sharing your word father God we love you as a church thank you for this community in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. guys thank you so much 
for allowing me to be here with you guys. Thank you. I appreciate this whole week. You guys have been awesome. God bless you. If you want to get in contact with me, just follow me on Instagram. Send me a DM. We can, I can pray over you, whatever it takes. I'd still love to build a, for, a relationship with you in Christ. Thank you, guys.